So by way of introduction, for those who don't know me, my name's Dan Harris, and I'm the founder and CEO of Neurodiversity in Business. Really delighted to be here today, the 7th of October. It's a beautiful sunny day outside, at least in the UK. And uh, I've been excited about this event for weeks, actually, because we've got two of the the leads from um, the, the ND ecosystem, people who will be really delivering a lot of value to, to the membership and wider community today. Um, so I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna ask Fiona and, and Aidan to introduce themselves and then uh, just briefly, and then we'll throw it back to me and I'll kind of set the scene a little bit and then we'll get started on the presentations. So Fiona, over to you. Thanks, Dan. Hello, everyone. Really nice to be here. Um, so I'm Fiona Barrett, and I am the Deputy CEO of Genius Within. I joined Genius Within about eight years ago now. And prior to that, I was a senior manager in the immigration service. So I managed high risk offenders and the staff that were working alongside them. Um, it was that real passion and, and, and a mission around social inclusion and exclusion that really kind of led my way to, to, to joining Genius Within. Um, so I, I'm on board to, to work in our social inclusion contracts uh, and also our wider commercial contracts. So, so that's, a, that's, that's our, my, my, my own real passion is around um, ensuring that people have the, the best options available to them. Um, a little bit about Genius Within. Um, we are a community interest company. 54% uh, of our staff are neurodivergent and 67% uh, of our staff based on female. Um, those are stats that we're really proud of. Um, and our mission is to support individuals to be at their best, uh, be that if they're in prison, unemployed, um, working as individuals or supporting those businesses. So yeah, that's, that's, that's me finished. Thank you ever so much, Dan. I look forward to presenting to you later. You're on mute, Dan. Mute. Thanks, Aidan. Uh, um, thank you, Fiona. Um, it's a real pleasure to have you here today and uh, for investing your time. That, that's really great. And Aidan, a brief introduction from you as well, please. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. You're very welcome. My own name is Aidan. I'm the chair of Lexic. Um, I, I suppose my passion for this space and for neurodiversity really comes from two areas. Um, personally, I grew up, my own mother has a disability, my wife has dyslexia. So I feel like I've navigated this world of barriers and exclusion for a very long period of time. Professionally, I guess that's complemented. I'm a psychologist by background. I was a project manager in Lexic, then the chief operating officer, then the CEO, um, and now the chair. So I've certainly gotten to know lots of different sides of the organization. And look, for those of you who don't know Lexic, I, I suppose our passion and mission over the last 15 years has really been, how, how do we translate the enthusiasm for neurodiversity into a kind of a rigorous execution like we would with other any other business initiative. And for us, that means high quality services, training and consulting and advisory services. And also how do we scale that? It's been very exciting for us to see not just neurodiversity grow, but our team grow as well right throughout the UK and Ireland. So yeah, looking forward to a an interesting conversation and delighted to be joined by Fiona Genius Within as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Aidan. And again, really appreciate you investing your time in this. So um, if I can just give a, a quick kind of scene setting here, just so that we, we kind of situate this session. So um, NIB launched uh, back in March of this year. Uh, it's been a whirlwind uh, six months since then. We have commenced our monthly series of membership workshops uh, and events. The previous one was with the amazing Judy Singer, which uh, I know a lot of you uh, participated in or um, followed later on, on on YouTube or our LinkedIn page. So we're having monthly sessions from the with the, the kind of intellectual capital and uh, intelligence and experience of, of the great and the good from across the ecosystem. You will be shortly in your inbox receiving our monthly newsletter, which will set out our next 12 month uh, schedule, which was really, really exciting for us. So have a look out for that and please do engage in some of the, the activity that we've suggested in that newsletter. 
I want to announce a couple of really exciting things here today. I want to announce the NIB annual conference will be taking place on the 16th of March next year. So that's bang in the middle of ND Celebration Week, uh, which is just a fantastic way for the ND community to come together. And no doubt Aidan will mention that briefly uh, a little later as well. Um, so please do save the date. We're going to be issuing a formal communication about that shortly. But for now, jump into your diaries, put a three line whip on the 16th of March. It's going to be a central venue in London. And this will be bringing together our amazing advisory board, which Fiona and Aidan are a key part, as well as our ND community partners. And also, um, really importantly, the neurodivergent individuals, the employees and potential in, in, uh, employees who are being disenfranchised at the moment. So again, that's the 16th of March. Please put this in your diary and further details will follow soon. Next thing I just wanted to remind people about is that we, um, announced a week ago uh, last Friday, the ND at Work market-wide study. And we're hugely excited about this as well. Um, please just keep following the, the activity on LinkedIn and we will be emailing a, a separate communication about how our corporate members can participate this in this and, and drive some real value. I'd also just briefly like to mention that the 21st of October is our next membership town hall. So I'm going to try not to speak too much today because there's uh, far more intelligent and eloquent co-presenters here than, than myself and Fiona and Aidan. But in the town hall, that's the opportunity for us to actually have more of a relaxed, interactive session and determine what's relevant for you, what your hot topics are, and really drive forward our strategy. Because as everyone knows, NIB is only a collective. Um, it's only a coalition. So we, we're really keen to get membership input here. And a couple of shout outs to other leading members of our advisory board. So um, Atif Chowdhury from uh, Diversity and Ability, he's running a great conference on the 5th and 6th of December. Please check out his website. Um, I'll be going along to that and I'll be on one of the panels. It's in Brighton and uh, it will be it will be really good fun. And also Amanda Kirby, Professor Amanda Kirby, who um, again is one of our leading uh, members of the advisory board. She currently has, uh, through Do It Profiler, her business, and working in consult consultation with City Guilds, um, she has a, um, an ND uh, survey out there as well. So I'd encourage you to go to her website, Do It Profiler. Okay, without further ado, um, I'm going to pass over to Fiona um, from Genius Within. And the, the idea here is that we're going to do um, a couple of presentations, we, we've, um, we're covering ND at work strategy. So how do you actually not jump into the tactical things, but try and project forward for the next three to five years? Um, we're going to do a, a presentation from Fiona, one from Aidan, and then possibly the most insightful element will be when we open it up for broader audience participation. So you'll, you'll all be very welcome to put questions in in chat. Um, we probably won't be able to look at them properly during the session but I will then compare some of the questions when we get to the end. We've got 90 minutes in the diary, so we're planning to finish at 1.30. So um, the, 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 the idea is that maybe we do the structured content for about 45 to 60 of those minutes, um, and then we've got half an hour, maybe a bit more of Q&A. So assuming everyone's happy with that plan, um, I'll hand over to my uh, esteemed colleague, Fiona. Thank you very much. Okay, bear with me while I do the old slide sharing. Great. So, I think I've already picked up, well, just, just to give you the weather, I'm in Sussex and it's not quite as sunny as it was, but um, there we go. But I do have the view of the downs and a race course, which is glorious as ever. Um, so I think what I really noticed already was, was um, Aidan and I share that real passion for neurodiversity and supporting people who are neurodivergent and I hope that comes across today um, because it's that passion and that drive that I think we, we, we all need when we're working in, in the field of, of diversity and inclusion. So today uh, we're talking about building that diversity strategy within your business. Um, you're here today so I'm, I'm assuming on that, that that people are already on that journey so thank you very much. 
Um, and I really hope that um, between Aidan and myself that we, we cover, um, uh, to give you some ideas, some prompts really of, of where to start or, or where you can go next. We can't possibly cover everything, but let's hope that we, we can give you those, those, those tasters. So just a little bit to set the scene a little bit about how Genius Within approaches our, our work in the, in the neurodivergent field. Um, we follow the social model of disability. Um, which is that people are people are disabled by the challenges that are created in their environment rather than their disability. So a wheelchair user is not disabled by their wheelchair, but by the stairs or a narrow doorway. And in the same way, um, a neurodivergent thinker is not disabled by the way that they think or maybe process things differently, but it's rather that the processes that that they are forced to use within that work environment, which might not suit, suit them. So we believe that if we can address the barriers for all those protective characteristics uh, and remove those barriers um, that prevent people accessing work, um, that then, then they can work at their best. And we, we that for us is a phrase of a systemic inclusion. Moving on to my next slide. Here we go. So, starting with exclusion, when we talk about levels of inclusion, we start with looking at exclusion. And that's a, a system or an environment where individuals are faced with pretty much predominantly all barriers. An example of this would be the prison system or someone who is long-term unemployed. Um, people may or may not be familiar with the statistics, um, but up to 50% of people in a custodial setting or who are long-term unemployed have, have got neurodivergent conditions um, and are not well represented at all in, in the workforce. So it's safe to say that they are facing exclusion. We then move to sort of compliance on an individual inclusion level. Um, and that is where we respond to an individual's needs one at a time. Um, so we make a disability adjustment, we maybe do an assessment. It's, it's resource intensive because it's at an individual level, but it's also not removing all the barriers for that individual simultaneously. So we may be addressing one area, but, but then not, 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 not the rest. So actually we're not allowing them to really progress and flourish. Um, we then have a, something called deliberate inclusion, which can occur in teams. Um, and this is where we, we, we target perhaps a specific disability or, or neurodivergence. Um, and an example of this would be, um, say, autism, um, who targets a technology specialist. We know that works. We know that that really can really create um, a, a, an environment for those individuals to flourish. But at the same time, it's, it's perhaps overlooking other talents. So maybe that, that dys dyslexic thinker, someone who's very creative, someone who's very good at 3D mechanical skills, we're overlooking that the wider pool of people by concentrating on, 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 one, on one small group of people. So at, at, at Genius Within, what we want to be looking at is systemic inclusion, which is the final, the final picture with our lots of happy people in the middle. Um, and in systemic inclusion, what we're doing is we're removing all the barriers that prevent people from accessing what they need to work at their best. It's an intersectional approach. It includes all the protective characteristics um, it's 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 recognizing that that everyone is an individual, but the adjustments are so similar that if you make them on a systemic level and in systemically within your business, you're actually creating favorable environments for, for everybody and not just those individuals. I should wait for the slide to load itself. So at Genius Within, we have 11 years of, of evaluation. Um, we've evaluated uh, thousands of clients in that time. And we've looked at, at, their, at their common areas of, of, of need that they've wanted to work on. And what we found is that these needs are common for everybody. 67% um, of people have said that they struggle with communication. 78% of people say um, it's time management, 83%. Um, struggling with organisational skills, and 92% is memory and concentration. So those are the common themes, and that's regardless of a condition that someone presents with. 
are those and what they're struggling with. So if it comes to say memory and concentration, it's that ability, it's that working memory, which is in deficit for people who are neurodivergent. Um, and it's that ability to hold information at any time. They can struggle to keep up in meetings um, and maybe keep focused. On the organizational um, level, what people could be struggling with is juggling multiple tasks um, and maybe finding it challenging to, to deal with that. And then they, they, they don't tackle any tasks so then they, they struggle with kind of completing their workloads. Time management, it's, it's taking things, type, it can take people longer to do a task than, than maybe a neurotypical person. Um, and that then leads to that decreased productivity. And then with communication, this could be written, it could also be, be verbal. Um, and it's the, the struggles that people can have with that. And, and what happens when people are struggling in these four areas is, is that their morale, their self-esteem dips. But also we've got that perception that happens as well. So we hear it a lot, oh, they're just lazy, uh, oh, they're, they're, they're not diligent. That's not actually the case, it's that people are, are struggling. So what we've recognized at, at Genius Within is that there are adjustments that you can put into place, everybody. Um, and so just to give you some examples around memory and concentration, it, it could be that you look at flexible time, flexible working. So it could be flexible start times or end times. Um, that helps with people's energy levels. Some people are far better working in the morning. Some people are, uh, are much more night owls. Um, and it also really helps people with sensory overload, but particularly, let's say, if people are commuting as well, and it's, it's reducing that, that rush hour sort of time and, and stress that can come with it. There's also the environment to consider. So is it, is it a noisy environment? Could it be that something like noise cancelling headphones can make a real difference or where people sit in an office or the, or the lighting? Um, and then something like giving people dual screens so they're not having to flick between things, which again can be really a real struggle for people with organisational difficulties or memory and concentration. And then looking at communication, what, what adjustments could, 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 could you as a business put in, in place for communication? And these are what we regularly rec recommend. Um, so it's how information is presented. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. We, we recommend that all information uh, is presented at a grade eight level language for all, for all documents, which then ensures that it's accessible for all. Um, something as simple as, as using a, a 12 point minimum of 12 point to home a font or a similar font then ensures you've got that accessibility. Um, and then simple things like giving questions in advance for, or, or agendas for advance just allows people then that, that to, to, to re remove those barriers that people may find in communication. And, and actually, what these adjustments don't just work for people who are neurodivergent but they work for everyone, whether you're neurotypical or neurodivergent, maybe have other disabilities. They're, they're workarounds, they're adjustments that people that make people's working lives easier. And if we can do that for everybody, then everyone, everyone benefits. Everyone benefiting is, has been coined as a phrase as the drop curve effect. So sometimes we make adjustments for a subset of a population with a particular need. In this instance, a wheelchair user, I'll go on to that in a minute. The adjustment, when broadly available, can also benefit a larger subpopulation, maybe beyond the intended group. Um, and when we constrain adjustments to be only available to a target group, we miss that opportunity, as I was saying, for, to, to benefit others. This came about, the reason this is called the, the drop curb effect is that there was a pilot in Michigan, 1940s, um, and with, within the, the Michigan, there was a small project and it decided to put ramps to build into curbs to make it easier for wheelchair and pushchair users. The, the overall effect was, it was much, much easier, but it wasn't just easier for wheelchair users and, and pushchair users. It was easier for the, much easier for the general population. So cyclists, delivery people, um, people with, with, with mobility issues. So it was so popular that now it's it's pretty much present worldwide in all highway policies is having a, a drop curb. Um, so it's a great example of how adjustments for, for one subset um, of a population actually benefit everybody. So what does that then mean 
in the workforce. How then, um, what are those drop curb effects that um, you could perhaps be looking at um, as you're sat here today going, oh, what can I do? What can I do in, 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 in my business? It's 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 what we've what I was just talking about with regards to our the reasonable adjustments the um, that affect everybody. It's it's looking at could there be a, a flexible time schedule? Um, how are you looking at that job design element? Um, how are you optimizing performance? What's the lighting like? Do people get headphones? Um, are there fans available for people? Post-it notes, colored paper. Nothing, nothing that's that's you know dramatically difficult for, for for most businesses to put into place, and then looking at that um, recruitment and selection, and talent retention, which is so important for for everybody. It's how you present that information. It's looking at making it accessible for everybody. The, the font size that you use, information in advance. Those could be some of your real win drop curb um, effects that that. You could get from today to really kind of think about and look at how you could influence in your business. So just to just to summarize, hopefully I'm within time, um, which I think is often helpful when it's lunchtime. Uh, I've got the thumbs up there from Dan. So if you take anything away from today, it's it's have a look at that drop curve opportunities in your workforce what are those flexible schedules how are you presenting that information what adjustments or equipment are there that are probably already present and people maybe aren't, aren't really using look for that intersectionality as well how is it going to benefit lots of protective characteristics which which people have, um, present with and and just finally for a bit of a stat because i do like a bit of a stat 1.2 million people um worldwide have a disability um, and if we are not defining how that environment is available for them, we are excluding 20% of our workforce. Now, the fact that you're here today makes me feel like I'm preaching to the converted, but it's just so important. We can't afford to lose that 20% of, of, of our workforce who bring creativity and diversity. So hopefully you've got some tasters for today. I will stop sharing. And thank you very much. Thanks, Fiona. That was really informative and I, I definitely enjoyed um, following that presentation. So thank you for your time. And um, we, we've had lots of lots of comments in the chat window. We're going to uh, we're going to come back to those during the Q&A where I'll be trying to absorb most of those uh, most of those comments. So, um, again, thanks, Fiona, on behalf of NRB's corporate membership. And uh, we'll now hand across to Aidan. Uh, as mentioned, he's the chair of Lexic and uh, he'll talk us through the same topic, but um, a slightly different angle and, and slightly different um, uh, perspectives. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, dear Dan, and thank you very much, Fiona, and good afternoon, everyone. Again, it looks like the sun is mostly shining from where you're joining us. Um, please do put comments in the chat, questions. Um, you know, I think Fiona and I really want to add value to you this afternoon. So the more challenges and questions and things you have to say to us after our presentations, uh, very much the better. So I am going to bring up my share screen. And my slide. And Dan, can you just confirm you can see my slide before I start moving? We're good. We're good. All right. Great. So look, I, I think to kind of build on some of the things Fiona was saying, um, I read a lot of organizational strategy in HR documents in my spare time. And I think what I see is pretty much 100% of organizations, especially over the last five years, now say they're committed to DNI. But I think when we actually look at those policies and look for neurodiversity, we really see a very limited percentage. I would say maybe somewhere between 10 and 20 percent. And I think the question we have to ask ourselves, the question you're probably interested in, in answering in your organization is, if the subject of diversity or disability has become so much more front and center, why is neurodiversity not equally on the business agenda? Or as Fiona said, why are we missing this opportunity to support 15 to 20% of our workforce? And look, I, I could kind of talk all day about the reasons for that, but I think some of the big ones for us is that neuro differences are often hidden. Uh, sometimes they're invisible. 
sometimes people don't have a label or they haven't been diagnosed what that label or sharing their identity or sharing their story has often been met with a lifetime of stigma, of judgment, of shame. So they say, you know what, forget it. I'm, I'm, I'm staying hidden. What's the point putting my head above water here and telling my story? I, I think the challenge and what we're passionate about in Lexic is you can't really say you're fully committed to DNI while leaving out this this uh, percentage of the population. And especially in more recent years, we've seen a lot of organizations say, okay, Aiden, I hear you. Expectations are growing on us to report on and act on and advocate for neurodiversity. I'm hearing about unique strengths and unique talents. But what do we do? Where do we get started? Because this can feel very overwhelming or very complicated, or we're afraid of getting it wrong. So I want to start just a, a little bit. Obviously, the, the title of this session was about strategy. And I just want to frame what I feel we're talking about when we talk about strategy. Strategy for me is generally your plan to try and achieve what you are trying to do. And what you are trying to do generally depends on your business's vision and aspiration, your mission, which is how you implement your vision, and the objectives or results you want to achieve. And underneath your strategy, you then have your approach and your tactics, which is generally your methodology and your action plan to support that. And I think generally when we see things go wrong in Lexic, it's often in one of these areas, which is there's a lack of executive buy-in. So you have a strategy and a methodology, but your leadership team aren't connected to it. Uh, you either don't have a clear plan or you have 400 things in your plan that it's not clear, or you roll out the CEO, you have executive buy-in, you have a plan, and then you hand it to a very busy HR department or a team of enthusiastic volunteers who might be very passionate, but may not have the time or the expertise to turn that into a kind of a business rigor. And, and so when you talk about strategy, I really want to focus on some of these areas up and down this kind of triangle and where you may be getting it wrong. Um, our framework in Lexic is called Neurodiversity Smart. We really do believe that, you know, when we're talking about strategy, we've got to be working on multiple things at the same time. But in the 15 minutes I have with you, I don't really want to talk about so much the what you need to do, because there is an awful lot of what across different areas of the organization. It's actually looking at some of the common hows and some of the common areas that I think we need to change and why it's not on the business agenda. So I, I guess the first thing for us to think is why neurodiversity hasn't been on the business agenda is you know, most of us have not grown up with the word neurodiversity. And all I can say is the people who kind of um, reach out to us in Lexic every day really wish they had grown up with that word because they had a lot of other words used to describe them in its absence. Learning difficulties, disorder, special needs, intellectual disability, and often a stigma of that, which is a medical approach or an assumption that that person lacks intelligence or assumption that that person doesn't add value to the workforce. And what we see a lot of organizations trying to do is they mean well, but they roll out something like this. This is a real line manager's toolkit rolled out by an organization. And it's talking about what to expect if you're managing someone with ADHD. And if we read through it, what do we see? All of these bullet points are all negative. They're all, um, they all focus on what the person cannot do. And I think one of the first things we have to think about when we frame this conversation is challenge stereotypes. Because most people in our organizations, when they hear the word dyslexia or ADHD or autism, they've grown up in a world where those labels are often seen as deficient. 
And if we want organizations to spend their money or time or incredibly busy senior people to add neurodiversity to that list, we've got to reframe that into a more positive vision. Um, I'll give you an example of a more positive example. This is from Cambridge University Hospital. They're talking about ADHD and they've reframed that into common misconceptions. They reframed it into strengths and they gave much more positive examples of how we actually support and empower people with ADHD. And that word neurodiversity really means different ways of thinking. It means different perspectives and different minds. And I, I think if we frame this conversation, we have to move to that. And that's often seen as the kind of moral argument or the social argument. The second big thing we see a lot in neurodiversity strategies is what's called the legal argument. Under the Equality Act, there is many neurological differences qualify as disability under the Equality Act definition of disability. What does that mean? A duty of care to make workplace adjustments. If you don't, you expose your organization to legal risk. And that's certainly a very critical part in building out a strategy and making an argument. Um, Fiona touched a lot on the kind of social model and, and how that's evolved, which is I may have challenges or impairments, but it's the design of society that really disables me. So if I said, imagine a new building, and I said, you know, we're, we're building this new building and there's no lifts, there's no ramps, there's no disabled parking spaces, there's no disabled bathrooms, you would say, yeah, that, that probably sounds ridiculous. Well, what if I said to you, there's a really important piece of information in our organization, critical to this organization, critical in your ability to do your job, but it's presented to you in a 42 page aerial font size eight, triple columned black text and a white background PDF. And this document is locked, so you can't copy it. Uh, it may not work with your assistive technology. As Fiona said, that's not a dyslexia challenge or a dyslexia impairment. In my opinion, that's actually poor design. And a lot of the adjustments we talk about that benefit people with neuro differences are actually benefiting everybody. Two of the most common adjustments for neuro differences pre-pandemic were working from home and flexible hours. And we spent years being told that couldn't be done. And I think we can all experience now the benefits of those adjustments and accommodations. But I, I, I think what we're so often forgetting when we talk about a strategy in the business agenda is that there's a value model. We're at neurodiversity in business here. So let me think, let's think about this in a business language. That 15% of the population, they're a talent attraction and retention opportunity. They're a brand opportunity. They're a customer opportunity. That 15% has a lot of money to spend in your business if you appeal to them. And neurodivergent people, if you can empower them to be their true and best selves, they have so much to contribute to productivity and innovation and creativity and all of these things we say we value. And that for me means organizational results. That means the bottom line. That means return for your shareholders. And I would say when you're presenting this, don't ask your leaders to do this because it's a nice thing to do or it's a moral thing to do. I think there's a risk in not doing it. And over the next few years, I think your organization is going to be left behind if you don't start investing in and appealing to this part of the population. So that's point number one, which is I, I think neurodiversity is often not on the business agenda because of the way we frame the argument. Move away from the kind of charity medical model into more of a talent, a social, and a value-based model. You need a strong vision if you want your leaders to care. And I think we're still presenting and framing neurodiversity in a very outdated way. So that's point number one. Second point I want to talk about is what we hear a lot is, well, this is too complicated. There is a fear of getting it wrong. 
and we don't know what to do. And there is a certain truth in that neurological differences can be complex. They can occur individually or co-occur. They can, they can occur very differently in different people and different people have different needs. But I, I think as Fiona said, one of the key things to think about is, is not making this a dyslexia conversation or an autism conversation or an ADHD conversation, it's actually focusing on barriers because many people in your organization for a wide variety of reasons will hide their condition or they don't even know that they have that label on themselves. So you've got to work faster and think beyond kind of medical diagnostic processes when you're providing support to employees. And if you focus on medical proof or rely on everybody having a really neat label for their experience, I think that slows you down. I think it's unhelpful. And how do you really ensure that everybody who needs adjustments, regardless of whatever label they might have or whatever name they put on their condition is actually getting access to them? One of the big things we see in Lexic, I, I suppose, uh, with getting your strategy right, is often focusing on this process of adjustments. Fiona's talked about lots of the kind of common adjustments that might be available, but I actually want to kind of talk slightly about the process, which is, let's say I'm an employee and I walk into my line manager's office and I say, you know what, I, I've, I've heard for you, people have said to me for years that I might have ADHD. Um, I think it's impacting my work. I'd like some support. I'd like to know where do I go? What do I do? And what that process looks like. And where we see that often go wrong is people are sent to their GP, a psychiatrist, HR, the NHS, occupational health, their private medical insurance provider, access to work, the ADHD foundation, you Google a provider, and so on and so forth. And while systemic change is very important, the really the experience of your adjustments process is so critical for so many neurodivergent staff, particularly if you're a smaller organization in the trust they have, the relationship they have, and how they feel within that organization. And I, I guess what I would really say as well as a key part of that adjustments process is the line manager themselves. One of the key things I think we've learned in Lexic over the years is you can have the best tools, the best passports, the best processes, but if they don't land in a culture where neurodiversity is celebrated and included, then that won't take you very far. And a good process in HR on paper does not necessarily translate to a good experience for your employees. And I think particularly we hear again and again with line managers, it's how do we include their feedback? How do we empower them? And how do we kind of help if someone walks into, into a line manager's office wanting to start a conversation that the process of adjustments is really clear and that line manager feels empowered and confident in having that sensitive conversation and going through that process. So that's point number two, which I think is focus on barriers and not conditions, and then really think about the kind of process for individuals and line managers. Some of you, you know, may not have big budgets, you may want to start small. And I really think the experience of an individual and a line manager goes such a long way in having a positive experience. And finally, and I will wrap up on this point number three, which I, I think is really about leadership and, and accountability. Um, because this work is so personal, supporters and advocates, I think, are often motivated by emotions. And emotion is so critical to raising awareness and inviting others to the conversation. But when it comes to actually implementing organizational change and development, being fired up is, is not enough. You've got to go through that process through research and collaboration and design and continuous learning and 
budget allocation and reward and recognition and so on and so forth. And I, I think one of the big things we see a lot in Lexic and, and a lot in our work is we've got to hold ourselves and to get leaders to be accountable and responsible. That means if you're in a leadership position, finding that senior champion and acting as a senior champion. It means distinguishing between an organizational steering committee and a group of volunteers on an employee resource group. And I think especially in the world we're entering, where a lot of organizations are really starting to look at budgets or they're starting to look at the money they've spent over the last few years on DNI, or initiatives have to have the same meaningful KPIs and indicators and measures and professionalism as any other business initiative. So look, um, that's a bit of a summary for me. I think finally, the one thing I would say too is, you know, just get started. Every organization's journey is different. What works in one organization may not work for you. But I, I think what people will really respond to is some positive intention. You can start small, you can build on things year on year, but I think one of the most important things is to actually really be honest as to what your organization can achieve. And I think to summarize for us, our passion is, can we imagine a world what would be like if we really tapped into the potential of that 15% of the population. And I think that's a very exciting world for the organizations that are starting to invest and, and are starting to really get that right. And if you're burying your head in the sand, I think you run the risk of losing talent, losing productivity, and really losing that opportunity over the next few years. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. I look forward to taking your questions. And you can reach out to us in Lexic anytime if we can help. Dan, back to you. Thanks, Aidan. And uh, again, I, I, I really enjoyed that. I, I learned something new, Aidan, every time I hear from you. And um, I know we've also had a number of questions coming in through the chat. So um, we're running up to about 10 minutes before one. Uh, we have until 1.30 at your disposal. There's no expectation or requirement that we go all of that time. But I was pretty robust and firm with Fiona and Aidan. They both wanted an hour, hour and a half. They love to talk about this topic. It's, it's their passion. Um, but what I said to them is actually, let's condense down your, your presentations to the minimum possible. So we gave them kind of 10, 15 minutes each. And what we're planning to do now is just have more of an interactive dialogue because I often I go to lots of these events and I think we all see a lot of slides right but the real value is in that human interaction so with that in mind um, I've got a few questions um, but I'm going to allow the the audience as well to um, kind of come up with their own we have been having a few come in the chat window and I've been trying to scribble down some of them in the background um, Ian, um, why don't I'm, I'm actually just going to ask my teammate Matt, are we able to take everyone into the kind of um, uh, the, the, the place where they can jump in rather than me mediate questions? Is, is that technologically possible for us, Matt? Uh, apologies. So sorry, Dan, do you mean um, they can all uh, unmute themselves and ask a question? Um, exactly. Yeah, I'll just have a look one second. Can you change from Zoom webinar to Zoom meeting? I don't think you can. I don't know. We, we've tried it before and I think we managed to get around it. But if not, I will start off with, um, with Ian's question. So um, we'll, we'll pose it to both people. Um, and in this instance, we go to Aidan first. So in trying to understand what percentage of companies businesses are committed to neurodiversity inclusion, Presumably, we, we can start with NIB founding members and make an assumption or get a commitment from them that they are at the very least 100% committed to embrace, uh, um, embracing ND. Um, is there a pledge um, from NIB members at a corporate level when they get on, on board? So that's kind of part A. And then I, I think I can answer that. And then part B, if they are coupled with exam some of the examples of the benefits they're realising on the back of this strategy, 
it could be a powerful driver to others. And I know it already happens in some sectors, but there's room for expansion uh, in the private and public sector. So, Ian, I, I apologise. I've probably um, done a, a worse job than you would have done of expressing your question, but hopefully I got your intent. Um, I'll cover the NIB point in a second, but I'll throw the, the concept across to, to Aidan initially, and then Aidan will throw it to Fiona. So I, I, I guess the, the question is, you know, what percentage of companies are committed? And, and, I, and I also suppose, is there a pledge? And also, I think, Ian, if I've understood your question is, are there examples of, of the benefits? So, you know, absolutely. I think we've seen a lot more companies um, start talking about neurodiversity and embracing statements on neurodiversity than we've seen a couple of years ago. Um, I think I would always challenge companies though that what does committed actually mean and we've seen a lot over the years with other dni initiatives things like oh we want to attract neurodivergent talent or we want to empower our neurodiverse employees that's a very vague commitment and i think a lot of our work in lexic is actually really breaking down what does that look like how do you measure success in that and also, I suppose, what resources do we need to put in to make that happen? Um, but I also agree with your point on the actual benefits of doing it. As I said in my presentation, I think a lot of organizations still frame the neurodiversity conversation as simply, it's the right thing to do, or we have people with challenges and we need to get them support. And I think if you do that purely, you don't tend to get the attention of your C-suite because they're not always driven by what is the right thing to do. They're driven by what's good for their business. So I think if we can reframe some of the passion and enthusiasm around the moral and social argument and balance it with a talent and value argument, that will go a long way in getting neurodiversity more on the business agenda. Uh, I hope that answers the question and Fiona, welcome to share any thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Aidan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Ian, for your question. Um, I think following on from what Aidan was saying, I think we've got, it's absolutely right, it's about getting that seems to be buy-in. And then from there, I think we need to think about how we address um, maybe the, the, the middle manager level as well, because there's what we, what we see in Genius um, is a lot of, um, lack of confidence really um, within that, that line manager about how they work with people um, who, who are neurodivergent. Um, and as I was preparing for this, actually, I came across um, some quite useful research from the ILM, the Institute of Learning and Management. They did a study only two years ago now, 2020, um, and it was talking about um, how comfortable hiring managers were with hiring neurodivergent individuals only 50% of those line managers who um, responded to that research said that they felt confident. Um, and, and what was even more significant was that um, there were higher levels of bias, particularly around hiring people with Tourette's or ADHD. Um, and 32% of people said they'd be uncomfortable managing people with, with either Tourette's syndrome or, or ADHD. So, you know, that obviously was quite an honest, I would say, um, feedback. But I think we've we've really got to 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 uh, to address that that confidence level, how people feel on an individual basis about working and line managing neurodivergent members of staff. Um, because I think if we've still got that bias there, um, that unconscious bias is going to come in when people are hiring, and unfortunately, we're not going to um, un, 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 un find that and tap that talent that we know we've got. Um, so yeah, we've got that strategy, we've got the C level, and then I think below that as a business is then working with those individual line managers about how they then support their, support their diverse workforce. Thank you, Fiona, and, and thanks, Aidan, for those responses. Um, just a point of order for the, uh, the, the audience here. Um, apparently, my esteemed colleague, Matt, has told me that if you were to raise your hand in Zoom, we can enable you to speak. Um, and you can ask questions directly rather than me uh, being an intermediary. So, um, Matt, just come back on to um, come back onto audio and just explain. So we've now got Ian. Excellent. So Ian, can you speak? Hi, can you hear me? 
Right. Yes. Hi, Ian. Hi Hello. there. Thank you. I thought I probably felt obliged to come back in. Um, th thanks for the response. It was triggered from your first or second slide, Aidan, really, about you know, this blank, what percentage of you know companies are committed. And I, I guess I was trying to square that in my head as to how that sat. And, and I, I take your point. It's not just about the kind of high level C-suite commitment at the top top end. It's very much like what Fiona was talking about. It's how you get this, you know, the middling level of organizations, especially the bigger ones, to, to get fully on boarded with what what to do and, and how to embrace it in you know an effective way. So thank you for that. Yeah, and I, I might just add in, I mean, you know, I, I talked a little bit about neurodiversity smart in my intro, which is our own kind of accreditation. I, I think a lot of managers in C-suite aren't held to account because there's not really a framework to hold them account to. And, and in that, neither is there really a framework for many organizations to celebrate success, to celebrate what they are doing. Neurodiversity is, is still a relatively evolving area on the DNI agenda compared to other characteristics. And I, I guess for us, you know, we really try and actually build in that accreditation, that milestones, those accountability metrics. And, you know, it's it's the old management dictum of kind of what gets measured gets done or what get measured get met, gets managed. And so a lot of our work is saying, okay, you're committed, but what does that actually mean in your organization? And if you're going to spend time, resources, and money, how do we show success and, and the wins and the benefits for that time, resources, and money? Yeah, I, I think some some big organizations use these, you know, voice of the people, so the employee surveys where they ask thousands of people for a pulse feedback. And I think that's where you're going to find out whether something's effective, not whether it comes out, you know, through the corporate comms line. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I think employee surveys, hiring metrics, um, you know, feedback from employee resource groups, all of these are much more realistic assessors, I, I think, of how your organization is doing, as opposed to kind of, you know, looking at com corporate communications. Thank you. And, and Viona, welcome to add anything in there now that we've got Ian expressing his views better than I did. Yeah, thank you. No, I mean, I think, I think you, you, you know, you hit it on the head there, um, Ian, when you were talking about it, it's not just those, those corporate messages, um, it's finding out how people are experiencing within that workforce, isn't it? Um, and also, you know, like I mentioned, you know, your employee resource groups, your, your, your staff surveys, um, you know, the internal, um, you know, is there a buddy system? You know, how, how are people, how, how are line managers getting supported? How are the individuals getting supported? Um, it's it's then getting that, that anonymous regular feedback um, because it's not just about it happening once, but it's about that regular so that you can you can measure change. And I think, you know, a big step maybe for, for an organization is to, to acknowledge that they've, that they've not got it right, um, you know, which is hard, we're vulnerable, isn't it? But, um, you know, make, make, make that, you know, pledge what you want to do. Um, what are your strategies? Um, and then if you are, as a business, going to encourage uh, employee resource groups, body systems, make sure that, that everyone's got time to do that, um, because otherwise it, it will be just on goodwill. Um, and, and that isn't a good um, DNI strategy um, because that kind of falls again. So it's it's about it's get it's, it's a planning, isn't it? It's, it's, as Aidan was saying, it, it's it's getting your strategy, it's getting your buy-in, but then it's planning it um, so that so that it works and revisiting it if it doesn't work the first time. Um, I think that's something else, isn't it? That every business is different. Um, different people move on, and leaders have different um, experiences and, and um, charges. So it's just about acknowledging sometimes about where people are, where, where the vision is, where people want to go and how you're measuring how to get there. Great, thank you. Great, thanks Ian. So we've uh, we've proved the technology works. This is fantastic. Um, so I'm very happy to summarize some of the questions that have been coming out, but equally um, happy for others just to raise their hands and then Matt will uh, bring them into this conversation. So. Um, anyone who's just posed a question and would like to verbalise them, please feel free to jump in now 
and Matt will bring you live. Okay, so we've got uh, Julianne, if I pronounce that correctly. Yep, that's correct. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Julianne. Hi there. Hello. I, I uh, slightly, sorry, I feel like we're, this is slightly like a phone in radio show. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> So you're uh, you're on you're on with Aiden and Fiona, Julianne. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> um, yeah, I, my question's around. Um, it was sort of prompted by an earlier comment from somebody around the kind of onus being on the neurodiverse community to actually sort of lobby and, and create these sort of groups of enthusiastic volunteers to um, move things forward and 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 create these sort of changes in organisations. Um, but what I'm interested in is any examples you've seen of allyship manifesting in businesses. So where you've see, seen the owners actually being equally on those who are neurodiverse or have an association with um, neurodiversity, like someone in the family or something, and others who may not necessarily have had any kind of um, interaction with neurodiversity in their life, but have, have actually then gone on to play a part in um, in lobbying for the same sort of strategy and goals i'd be interested to hear about your experiences there and, and thoughts on how we can do more of that and encourage more of that Fiona, excellent like well, look, first this time yeah yeah, yeah. Fiona, why don't you go yeah first? yeah um great question i think allyship across all um um dni spectrum is is is, is vital um because it, it, it can't just be um, the, the, the neurodivergent uh, community that um, works together to, to, to force change. Um, we, we see it um, quite a lot, actually, um, within different organisations that we work. Sometimes it, it can, um, the allyship can form, as you said, because people have got um, maybe life experiences, maybe they've got family members, maybe they've, they've got friends um, who, who are neurodivergent. And I do think there is an element of, some, there is a, a lived experience somewhere that, that maybe sparks that passion um, because it, it does envelop passion. Um, and, but from that then, I think it's, it's raising that awareness, you know, 15 to 20% of, of, the, of the population are neurodivergent. And if we then include um, acquired neurodiversity such as mental health or long COVID, um, you know, we're talking you know, up to 40% maybe of, of, of the population. So it, 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 it shouldn't just be um, that, that it remains as, 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 as you know, the, the neurodivergent um, person who's often struggling as well. You know, it is, it, as, as Ian said, or I think there was, a, I noticed a chat um, that was going on when Aidan was speaking about, you know, as the neurodivergent person, I, I should be the one who um, has to go to HR and, and ask for the adjustments. Um, under the Equalities Act, it, it, you know, it's very clear that someone doesn't have to disclose um, a new divergent condition in order to protect it under the Equalities Act. It's actually up to the employer um, to put those adjustments in place. So it's beholden on us all, um, I would say. And I would say, you know, if, if it, I'd, I'd welcome anyone who, who um, to, be, to be the ally, to, to find out more, to be curious, to ask questions, to see how people can be supported. And, and to really then embrace how as an organization you can make that into your strategy. Um, what are those drop curbs? You know, what are those things that you could take away now? Ask the questions to someone who's neurodivergent. What would help you, um, you know, start those conversations going? Because then it's not always the neurodivergent person who's asking for the adjustments, who's raising the awareness. We've all got an onus to do that. Aidan. Yeah, th thanks for the question, Julianne. And, um, you, you know, to, to echo what Fiona said, absolutely, the responsibility is on the organization. And if you're in a, a leader in an organization, I believe you are responsible for the psychological safety and culture and attitude of that organization. And it won't hold up under the Equality Act to say, you know, we sent John with ADHD to the employee resource group with other people with ADHD and you know we have a team of enthusiastic volunteers and that's going to cover us. I, I think in terms of you know how you can be an ally there's lots of different ways you can be a sponsor you can be a champion you can amplify you can advocate 
Um, I, I think what we hear a lot from neurodivergent employees is the barriers they face adjustments often remove the barriers in their day-to-day -day environment. So a piece of assistive technology or coaching or other things, they don't remove the barriers in the organization or more widely. Attitude of a line manager, attitude of colleagues, attitude of HR. And I think if you are in the majority, that is actually really you're, I suppose, such an important responsibility. And yet there's lots of ways you can reach out as an ally, reverse mentoring through an employee resource group, inviting people to run events or write blogs or share their stories. But I, I think a big piece, what a lot of people want to hear is not just the story of the neurodivergent individual, they want to hear the story of the line manager. And I, I've I've kind of been in a lot of trainings where people are kind of looking at the line manager and they're going, really? And, and, and was it OK? And are you OK? And will I be OK? And I think if you're in the majority, um, there's such an important role there to say, you know what? Yeah, I'm a line manager and I'm taking the time to talk about this in my team and be flexible in my team and call out behavior in my team that may not be acceptable to our culture. I hope that answers your question, Julian. If not, feel free to, to challenge her. <laughs> yeah, that was really helpful. That's good. It's a good good thought about telling stories of the line manager. I think it extends right across to all realms of, of diversity and inclusion as well. So that's a great takeaway. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. And it definitely proves that maxim that um, the interactivity is better for us. So I'm glad that strategically we, we were short on slides and also that we let you people talk rather than me read your questions out. Um, we, we've had loads of questions now in, in the chat. So I'd in, yet again encourage anyone just to raise their hand if they're happy to verbalise. If not, I'll do my best to put Viona and Aidan on the hot seat for you. I think Matt, you will be watching in the background anyone who does raise their hands. Um, okay, absent of them doing so, I will uh, I will try and jump into the chat now. Oh, here we go. Um, Matt, do we have anyone who's raised their hand? Uh, not currently, Dan. I was just going to say I, I get a notification, so uh, I'll, I'll speak out when I see one. Oh, that's even better. OK, fantastic. Um, so uh, we had a, a question from Stella earlier, and there's been so many questions. I'm just struggling to, to find it briefly. Um, Stella, if you do want to talk, uh, you're welcome to. Otherwise, I will find your question. I'm going to find your question to Stella. Um... Yeah, I'm struggling now. There's too many, but I can I can paraphrase it. So, Aidan Viona, I think it was around the ignorance um, and how you deal with awareness. So there was a concern that there is still a significant lack of understanding, part one, and then part two, misunderstanding of neurodiversity. So what are your respective top tips in terms of um, enabling uh, peers and seniors and um, line managers to, to actually be better aware and, um, you know, a, a, adopt a more progressive start. So, um, Aidan, over to you first, please. Um, you know, obviously, a, a key part of that journey is raising awareness through conversations, through trainings, through events, through online learning through whatever methodology you can engage with your line managers. But I, I think what we hear a lot from line managers when it comes to raising awareness is, is they, they, have a, they have a few key needs, which is number one, they want to understand how to have a sensitive conversation. And I think in some ways, what Fiona and I both touched on is at the heart of that sensitive conversation is actually the barrier that person is experiencing, not necessarily the condition. You don't need to be a clinical expert on dyslexia and autism and ADHD, but if you can sit down with an employee and say, look, what, 
what's the barrier here? What's preventing you from being at your best? Or, or what are you like on a, on a good day? And what is it about this job or, or this system that's holding you back? And I, I actually think that goes a long way to progressing the conversation. But look on, on the broader stigma that exists around neurological differences. I, I agree that is a lifetime and probably several lifetimes of work. And we are always going to be pushing and moving forward in that. I, I think what can make the big difference we hear again and again in organizations is if you can get your neurodivergent community to talk about their own successes and their own experiences in your organization, that makes a big, big difference to changing your culture. But you can't just say, put your hand up and talk about it. You have to create psychological safety. You have to create a culture. You have to invite them. And all of that takes time. Thank you, Aidan. Over to you, Fiona. Yeah, thank you. So as, as Aidan said, obviously there is the, the awareness training and, um, and, 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 and raising, raising that awareness. Um, and, and yeah, having those conversations. And I think something that I, I think could be always useful is, is rather than concentrating on what someone is struggling with or can't do, because that's very often where people come, you know, they, they, there's a lot of, of, of the stigma. So people are, their self-esteem is very low. And if you think that people have struggled very often right through education, right into work, so their self-confidence can be incredibly low. Um, and if you ask them what they're struggling at, I bet they can give you a huge list of things. But as a line manager, I'd suggest maybe flipping it it's on its head a little bit and actually asking somebody what they're good at, which, which get that job description, what tasks do they excel at, what do they enjoy? What is it about those that, that work for them? So is there some job crafting you can do maybe by flipping some things, flipping that narrative a little bit? Um, and, and you'll find that maybe people relax a little bit as well when they start maybe to talk a little bit more about what they're good at because then you can you know drill into that the other element i'd say is um is co-coaching so something that we promote a lot of genius within if there is a a, a communication barrier between a, a an employee and a line manager and it does happen very often you know when we're looking at that individual it could be that that people are struggling performance wise at work or capability and and communication could be could be difficult so co-coaching so actually where you facilitate a coaching session between a line manager and a, and a manager it could just really free up giving someone the areas neutral just to kind of just give a different perspective so those are the two things really talk about the positives what someone's good at maybe some job crafting and then yeah think about co-coaching as a, as a facilitated communication point of contact it might be helpful. Thanks, Fiona. That was good. That was good. Thank you. Um, so we also have a question which has come in by the Q&A. Um, so uh, it's from anonymous attendee, so uh, I won't ask anyone to come off mute, um, but basically they're just asking about academic sources for understanding of neurodiversity at work. Uh, they reference uh, Amanda Kirby's book, which was uh, amazing um, on neurodiversity at work. But, uh, you know, what else are, is there in terms of large volumes of materials to understand what's being done across organisations? And the focus was on adjustments. How do you change the culture to place fairer demands on ND individuals? Um, so I'll ask, um, I'll ask the team to kind of provide some views on that and then I've got a particular question which has come to me on that, which is, could NIB be a point for sharing these? Um, absolutely. Um, you know, we are we're a charity designed with exactly that intent, which is bring together this amazing collective and, and coalition on this topic. So um, I do have some exciting news on that topic and we'll be announcing it later in the um, later in the autumn slash winter. Um, but over um, Aidan, why don't you go first on this one? And uh, let us know what you think about that kind of academic sources element. Yeah, um, academic sources. So there is a, a, a recent book that's been published. It's called Neurodiversity in the Workplace. It's by Suzanne Broyer and Adrian Colella, which is a much more academic book. Um, 
following Amanda Kirby's work. Um, there's a Centre for Neurodiversity at Work, which I know Fiona can talk more about, which looks at neurodiversity through an academic lens. But I, I would agree, I, I think Fiona, you would probably agree as well that, you know, we need more academic literature and research and good practice. And as I said in my talk, we don't really often have the rigor around DNI initiatives that we have around other business initiatives. And I think that's one of the areas that hold us back. In, in terms of how do you change the culture to place fairer demands on neurodiverse individuals? I, I, I think the big thing is thinking about how we frame this conversation around adjustments. And I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, I started my career in mental health and organizations kind of took the attitude of, well, we want you to share if you have any mental health challenges. But as soon as you shared those challenges, you had to justify those challenges. You had to go to medical professionals. You were often labeled you, and so on and so forth. So. For me, it's how do you make your adjustments process more proactive? So, for example, if you have cheaper or adjustments, maybe you can get on the high street. Does a person really need to go to their line manager or HR to get that? If you have a piece of assistive technology, could you look at a site license or making it accessible to all? And again, can you actually be proactive in communicating your adjustments policy and that adjustments are not just for this select group of people who qualify under a certain label, that actually adjustments are something that can benefit everybody. And I think about that in kind of working from home. Pre-pandemic, the request to work from home full time came with all of this stigma and all of these requests and all of these cases you had to make and believe me because we had to make an awful lot of them in lexic look at how that culture has changed and i think if we could change that culture on other types of adjustments that it's not a dyslexia conversation it's actually I prefer to send this to you in a voicemail rather than the word document. I prefer to present this in a mind map rather than a long piece of text. Or actually, I perform my best if I can fidget and move around and take more regular breaks. It doesn't mean I'm paying attention. And I, I really think that would go such a long way to normalizing and regularizing and leveling the conversation because so many people in our community are not diagnosed or they're diagnosed in their 40s or 50s and so what what happens with you know people who may not fit the label and i think that would go an awful long way sorry i could i could rant about adjustments all day so i <laughs> I, I know we, 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 it's just such a passion, isn't it, Aidan? We just we can't stop when we when we start. Um, I mean, it's a it's a fantastic question about um, where is the research around neurodiversity in the workplace. I'd open it up a little bit wider. Where is the research about neurodivergence uh, itself? There's there's we've got no um, definitions of, of 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 what dyslexia is. Um, people just don't agree. It's a really new, very um, under researched area um, and it's it's why our founder uh, of Genius Within, Dr Nancy Doyle, um, we have joined forces with um, Birkbeck University um, and um, their head of occupational psychology um, and have opened the centre of, of neurodiversity in the workplace. Um, so I could, I saw that um, Magnus, who, who's one of my colleagues in the chat, Put some something up there because I can't I can't do it quick enough. I can't type and speak at the same time. Um, so there is some research that's coming out. I know there's a paper that's just to come, about to come out about a specific condition in the workplace. I can't tell you what yet because it's not been published, but it's it's heading your way. Um, but but check out the Neurodiversity Research Centre. Um, Almut Professor Almut McDonald and Dr. Nancy Doll. They are both working incredibly hard to publish papers to really kind of get this area um, opened up and, 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 and get people talking about it a little bit more. And as I've said that, Madness has very helpfully put some research link there, so thank you. Thanks, but we Magnus. need more of it, we really do. Thanks, Magnus, that's, that's really helpful. Um, so we're, we're running up to 10 minutes late, uh, not 
10 minutes left rather than late, apologies. And so I think we'll probably limit this now to two more questions. Um, I've actually just got a, a, a quick question that I want to raise, but it's not um, a question I, I, I don't know the answer to, but rather I just want to talk about it because I'm, I'm super excited. So um, ND Celebration Week, um, Aidan, you just recently announced that um, the dates, if you'd like to kind of reconfirm those dates for the audience and maybe give us a, a kind of a very high level preview about what, what might be coming. Sure. I mean, just to say generally, um, Neurodiverse, Neurodiversity Celebration Week, it's a global initiative that challenges stereotypes and misconceptions around neurological differences. Uh, the campaign was founded by Sienna Castellan in 2018, I, I suppose primarily because she felt she had gotten all of these labels as autistic and ADHD and dyslexia that she felt not only weren't accurate but not actually very helpful in describing her experience and, and that's why she founded the campaign um i don't have a huge amount to announce about neurodiversity week other than you know the dates and the campaign you can go to neurodiversityweek.com to learn more i think dan you said to block the 16, I, I would just block the whole week in your calendar because there is most of the big neurodiversity organizations will be running events or conferences or initiatives or all kinds of great stuff during that week. So uh, I, I would just take the whole, I would just take the whole week off work right now because there's going to be lots of good stuff um, going on. And I know Lexic will do things and Genius Within will do things and many other organizations will do things as well. And uh, that 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 was really helpful, Aidan. And I, I would say, say that Sienna is just such a hero for us in the ND community. And uh, just what she achieved from a very young age, it's just been so impressive. And I, I've just seen so many testimonials from young people who have said how transformative her input has been. So really excited to support this. Mm -hmm. And um, again, our um, NIB conference will be in the middle of that week on the Thursday, the 16th of March. So looking forward to that. And maybe just to say that again, I, I think for me, there's, there's a, you know, there's a bold statement in the word neurodiversity, which it means different and not deficit. And I think there's a bold statement in, in that label, neurodiversity celebration week, because most of us have not grown up with the idea that these differences should be celebrated. And, you know, the majority population has a long history of making the minority population feel that their differences are wrong or they should be ashamed of them and so on. And, and I think that's what really excites me. And, and, and I think why we're very excited about this campaign is we have the chance for a generation to grow up with this word neurodiversity and also the idea that their differences have strengths and can be celebrated and they don't have to feel ashamed of them. Thank you. Okay, so running into the final question, uh, Lauren, um, you raised a question around buddying steam and within NIB's uh, corporate membership, this has been raised to us recently in a town hall about how important that is, but also how probably immature that function is uh, and, and the training involved. Um, Lauren, if you'd like to, you're welcome to verbalise it. Uh, otherwise, I'll just read out what you said. OK, so um, Lauren was asking about um, any advice that you would have for embracing a buddying uh, type approach for ND colleagues within within a business. And I think knowing Lauren uh, for quite a while, I, I know kind of some of the context here, which was around um, this buddying process. Ideally, what I'm seeing in NRB's corporate membership is that it should be separate from a, a formal coaching relationship. So it's important to distinguish the, the coaches who are more kind of being driven from maybe from the top and are more HR centric. And I think where the ND employees were really encouraged by buddying schemes is that feels grassroots it feels peer type relationships and and probably people who are experiencing the same uh, challenges or, or deficient support in the workplace so Fiona I'd love to love to hear from you initially on your your views on that topic 
I mean, I think uh, I think budgeting uh, all, all over is, is a is a is a good thing to do. Uh, we be that if you know it's new members of staff or, or within departments or, or maybe protective characteristics. Um, I think the thing about making budgeting successful for me is is setting what the what the parameters are, and I think you touched on it, Dan, when you said this isn't coaching. So you know. What's the budgeting going to look like? What are those expectations that people are setting? Um, and, and so, is it, you know, how regular is it going to be? What's it going to cover? Uh, how, how's that contact made? Because the, that different kinds of communication can be really vital for people, um, different people, different new diverse conditions. Some people may prefer oral, some people may prefer written. So, you know, really, really think about spending some time um, looking at what the parameters would be. Speak with other people. Find out what people what, what people would want because not everyone's going to want the same bodying. Um, and then I think the, the trick is going to be around that because we know that um, it, neurodivergence can be can be a hidden disability. Um, so it's people feeling feeling confident. Um, so maybe it's about it starting grassroots and then and then and then building up. But then it's also that that line manager that sea level buy in. Who is going, you know, is time going to be provided within that work day for the budding to, to take place? Because if it isn't, um, we're, we're not facilitating it. So it's, I suppose I'm, I've gone to logistics. I am a bit of a planner. I like logistics. So, um, yeah, spend spend some time um, sort of thinking about that. Um, and, and then maybe also consider two different people buddy might not work you know just have a real think about logistics i'm not saying don't do it but i just think um you know set it out first um because i think it, it could fly it really could if you really kind of set those parameters and you've got the buy-in from the, from the organization go for it aiden over to you yeah, I, I think to echo some of the things Fiona has said, first of all, you know, we actually do have quite good research on peer mentoring schemes, not specifically in neurodiversity, but across many other spheres of DNI showing very good success. And while Lexic and Genius Within have many neurodivergent coaches or psychologists on our team, I do think a lot of people really benefit from talking to a peer in their organization. Um, I think there are a few things to consider. Buddy scheme or mentoring scheme is very vague. So be very clear what's the nature of your development activity. Is it career development? Is it personal growth? Are you just hanging out and, and having fun and chatting? Because it, I think that will very much determine the type of people you recruit and screen and select to be buddies or mentors. And also, I suppose, the type of training and support you provide those mentors. And I, I guess a lot of work in budding and mentoring schemes is actually ensuring both the mentor and the mentee have clear boundaries and that the mentors have an outlet for support if they have questions, if there's a challenge raised that they don't feel comfortable in dealing with. And I, I think the last thing I would say, and look, we I, I kind of bang out bang on about this, it's it's how you frame it. Um, I've seen some buddy schemes and mentoring schemes rolled out in a very kind of negative and stigmatizing way like you know here's a buddy to support you so I think how you market it how you recruit for it how you talk about it is also very critical in getting that right got it excellent okay well I'm going to close the um the, the chat window for now and with a with a couple of minutes left and we've timed this perfectly so well done Aidan uh, well done Fiona um I just want to conclude with a few thoughts, really. Number one is a real strong measure of appreciation. Viona and, and Aidan through Genius Within and Lexic are extremely busy. The, the marketplace for ND consultancy services is absolutely red hot. So to, to get them to spare an hour and a half, I think all of our corporate membership re really appreciate that. Um, I'd also like to say- might not be as red hot as you think, Dan. I, th I think- <laughs> Uh, there, there's a lot of talk about neurodiversity, but it doesn't necessarily mean commitment and change. So, right? agreed. Well, here my third point in my uh, my summary. So, um, point two was going to be about 
how impressed uh, I am with leaders in the ND community, because for the first time I see everyone coming together, sharing the same aim. So we're putting aside commercial interests and we're actually thinking about our beneficiaries here are the neurodivergent employees and also importantly, the potential employees, those who are being disenfranchised from the workplace. So I'm so proud of everyone on, on this call and also our amazing advisory board and, and our co-production board. And then third point was going to be, and, and Aidan, you alluded to this, and it's almost like we planned this out um, as a good segue. But actually, despite all of this optimism and the fact that ND is now being talked about in the, in, in the top tables, in our interactions with our 400 odd members, uh, corporate members, um, we do just see such a low level of maturity in this space. Um, and I raise that not to admonish um, or, or kind of criticize, but I, I just wanted people who were kind of sending us concerned messages saying, actually, I'm so frustrated with my organization or I'm just not making headway. You are in a big group, so you are not unique. Um, and we are at the start of a multi-year journey. Now, NIB are not in the space of providing consultancy services. We're all about bringing, bringing the, the organisations together with our membership and our individuals. So do reach out both to Genius Within and Lexic, but also to, to the others. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll be publicising something quite soon in terms of a, a services directory, which will enable organisations to reach the, the, the experts in the field. Um, and then... Uh, Two final points are have a look out for our membership newsletter, which will be hitting your inbox. Please ping me directly if it doesn't get to you. Some organisations' firewalls are super aggressive and, and block everything. Um, so if you're not getting anything from NIB, do reach out to us directly. Um, and uh, lastly, again, uh, you know, save the date for the 16th of March next year. We're, we're really excited about running our market why uh, our, our, our annual conference um, so we've we've kind of elapsed our time we've done 90 uh, frantic and insightful minutes and I've really appreciated everyone's attendance and and sharing that journey and you know we're all behind this mission which is neuro inclusion now and that that's the kind of tagline I'm following at the moment so thank you for everyone's attendance have a lovely afternoon and, and a great weekend when it comes bye-bye Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, everyone.